proceed. Now, Alexander Senier is, uh, is the founder and CEO of Componolit, and he is going to talk to us about program verification with component-based architectures. Enjoy. Thank you. Um, so, first a little disclaimer. Um, I will not be talking about functional programming until the last slide. So, if you feel like running away because of that, that would be your chance. Good, um, who are we? Component is a small company based in Dresden. Um, and our topic is secure component based uh, system. What that is, I will um, detail later. Um, right now we have a focus on secure mobile devices. So like think of smartphones and tablets, but we're also um, gaining more and more focus on, on industrial security um, because that's, that's a big, becoming a big issue. A big issue. Um, we have a couple of principles. Um, first, free software, so everything we do is um, going to be released under uh, an open source license, so it can be reviewed um, independently, reused. Um, of course, we also um, use open source um, software extensively. Um, and as a second point, open development, that means you can see what we are doing um, and what we're discussing in our project um, on GitHub and uh, we, you could also step in um, and join the discussion on, on how we solve our problems. And lastly, um, we want to do security by design, we want to build secure systems but not by retrofitting security into something that um, is not secure initially. Um, and so we think about security first um, and then um, look into how we can build the functionality that's desired. Um, but when I'm not talk uh, talking about functional program, why am I here in the first place? Um, I'm the first time at BobConf and what excited me uh, about the conference actually is, uh, is concluded here in the motto of the conference. So, um, what happens when we use what's best? That's um, the, the German claim was even a bit catchier, but um, that's a question that I'm wondering about for ever actually since I started using computers and started programming. Um, what could be techniques and tools that really um, give you the correct result? Um, and that's I, I want to talk a bit about the way that I I did. Um, on, on, on that path, actually. Somewhere in the mid-90s, um, I would say, I started programming uh, with Pascal under DOS. So I will, I will keep talking a bit on the one side about programming languages, because that's uh, what you need when you want to implement something, and about operating systems, because we are building systems, and that's always something that's underneath um, what you're, um, underneath your program. So I started with, with Pascal and DOS, um, DOS was really a pain because uh, no separation whatsoever when, one, when the program you were running crashed and everything crashed actually. Um, that was a bad thing. I pretty much liked Pascal actually, so it had a rather clean structure. It was comparably verbose to, to, uh, compared to other languages. <coughs> but um, everything was, was rather clear to me and um, it, uh, I found it very uh, a very clear language. What was a, a drawback a bit is that low-level programming was not, not that easy and there were, were some limitations. Um, a bit later, late 90s I believe, um, I then moved to Linux and C. Linux was a big, big improvement. Um, we had the source code, we could build it and customize it um, as, as we wanted to. But C was actually a huge step back totally unsafe, you had to fiddle around with pointers. Um, <clears throat> it was easy to, um, to, to shoot yourself in the food to implement buffer overflows, integer overflows and everything. Um, this is a, a, real, um, a real security incident that, that is known as the go to fail bug. Um, that's a copy and paste error actually, which, um, well, the, the language design has not, um, well, has not captured actually. Um, so, by just having this uh, this indented, uh, uh, or actually having this look like an indentation and not um, spotting that 
Now that go to fail actually only belongs to that block, and that go to fail immediately goes to fail. So C was not really a big improvement compared to Pascal. So I, I continued looking what would be the best to build um, to build good and reliable systems. Actually, um, I, I played around with other operating systems like uh, FreeBSD and NetBSD, which also um, had nice properties, and came across Ada, uh, which the one or the other may know. It's uh, been heavily used in safety applications, for example. Um, and Ada had, was um, apparently inspired by Pascal, so it has also this rather verbose but clear structure, and it has some other nice properties like uh, strong typing. So in Ada, um, you can define two types, uh, one for two floating point types, one for meters and one, one for miles. And you cannot design that, assign them to each other um, because they are really distinct types despite being floating point. Um, and that has the nice property um, that your mask probe is not gonna crash into mask because someone has confused meters and miles. Um, but still, um, that was, I, I didn't feel that was enough to build reliable systems. And what we've came up, uh, come up with today and what we're using, that's actually the content of this talk. Um, so we want to know what, what's best, um, what's best to build our secure systems, um, to build trustworthy systems. But first, why, why should we care? So if we not use what's best, what's going to happen is um, security incidents and flaws that um, typically can, can have severe effects. And that's the outline of, my, of the rest of my talk. First, um, I will talk about these consequences. What is the problem um, that can happen if you use the, the wrong technology, if you use unsafe uh, languages and monolithic systems? Um, then I will talk about the solution that we have come up with for us and that we think works uh, pretty well to build uh, critical systems, which is the component-based systems approach um, as well as program verification. And I will also talk, I'm not at the end of the journey of looking for the right tools. Um, I will talk about what we think we should be doing in the future and also hoping to get some inspirations here. So first, what's the consequences of not using what's best. This is an example from 2015. Um, the one or the other may have heard about it, the stage flight bug. That was a really severe um, vulnerability in Android, which it, it, um, affected actually billions of devices. What happened there? Um, you could um, send a crafted media message, um, like a, a, a video or um, um, an audio st stream, and if it uh, that would then <coughs> that would then trigger an overflow and could bring your Android device under control. And the, the real severe thing about this was um, that it was remotely exploitable. Like I sent you a message, and you, your phone would would be rooted and would would be under my control. And as you can, as Android is rolled out on so many devices, it's it's the market leader in in, in mobile operating system. This really had severe consequences, and the issue is this has not been solved since. So since 2015, when this big, big issue um, became public, um, 350 bugs, which are critical or high, um, that means they can exploit it either remotely, like the original flaw, or locally. Um, that means I, I have to have the user make click on some file or something. 350 of these bugs emerged, and they all have follow a similar pattern, integer overflows, underflows, buffer overflows, all these things that come from unsafe languages. <coughs> um, why do we have such a severe problem, for example, in the Android operating system? Um, the key issue here, um, next to the, the programming language issue, also is the structure of the systems we typically have today, which is monolithic. That means, um, we have large subsystems, and that's why I, I didn't stay with Linux, for example, which are monolithic. There's a lot of functionality there, um, and that functionality is as complex as it gets, like networking stacks, device drivers, 
file systems. That's all non-trivial functionality. And that is running in one very big program which has the most privileges that are possible on your, in, in your system. Um, so if in that system uh, or in, in any part of that system um, there is a bug that can be exploited by the attacker, um, then it will influence all the other parts of that, of that system. So there is no, no isolation in, uh, in the Linux kernel between subsystems, for example. And it's very large. Uh, the current Linux kernel has something like 20 million lines of code. And if, if there is a bug anywhere, even if it's a subsystem that you don't usually use or need, then you're out of luck then. An attacker could bring your system under control. And the same happened with the media um, lip stage fright issue. If you have an app that uses the media framework, which also is a usually complex thing, um, and that app um, gets some gets compromised or crafted file that it uh, loads into that media framework to, to play back a video, for example, um, then someone can bring that media framework under control, and as it runs with high privileges and there's weak isolation here, it eventually could bring the whole system under control. And as this media framework is shared between other apps too, um, you don't even have separation between these, these applications anymore. So um, we refer to this, this software that you need to trust that everything is, is secure and, and, and is right in your system as a trusted computing base. And for such a system like Linux and, and Windows anyways, um, this is huge. This is in the many million lines of code uh, area, which must be correct so you can be sure um, that your system does the right thing. Um, I will present our approach, how we can get past that issue. Um, I need to st uh, state some constraints that we have because our solution is a bit specific to what, what we wanted to build. Firstly, we want to minimize the trusted computing base. So if you run a program on our, our platform, um, the, the code that needs to be right and trusted should be as small as possible. But also we want to do system and low level programming. Um, so it should be possible with the tool set and languages and system to, to, for example, write an operating system kernel or device driver, but also up to more complex things. And last point, it should be low overhead, which means um, we didn't feel like we want to have something like a complex garbage collector which kicks in at arbitrary times, for example, when you do crypto in a trusted component. And this is something that you don't really want to have. You want to have your, your timing deterministic if possible. So that's, that's the constraints. Um, and what we're doing is to use a component-based system. Um, we rely on an open source um, framework, which is called the Genome Framework. Um, that's a website if you want to have any details. And this has some nice properties um, which mitigates or which solves the issues that are just presented with the monolithic system. It has a recursive system structure. So um, we have such a tree here, and the tree starts with, uh, with the root, which is a microkernel. The microkernel is also the most privileged thing in your system, but um, contrary to Linux, it is very small, like in the five to 10,000 lines of code area. And it only does what is necessary to, um, to achieve this isolation between different components, like managing resources, um, making uh, scheduling between processes, um, separating memory, assigning devices. And that's pretty much it. It also will typically allow you to create communication channels between these components, but they, those components then need to adhere to some communication policy, which I will talk about in a, in a second. Um, the second nice thing about the system is um, it has this hierarchical structure and the parent always, firstly, is responsible for his child. So if the parent creates a child, it needs to provide the resources. On the Linux, um, you could just um, get many file descriptors, get many physical memory to, to create a lot of childs and, and eventually make the kernel run out of memory. And that's true for other, for other frameworks and other, other parts in, in monolithic systems too. What, what's happening in this uh, recursive system structure, um, if this process wants to create these three sub-processes, it needs to provide the memory and the CPU quoter, 
and all, um, to, to actually create these processes and it needs to pass these, these resources to the kernel to create its trials. And you can see what, what, um, that, what we achieve with this property. So the subsystem here then is isolated and it cannot exhaust any resources of any other component in that system. Um, and as a third thing, we have some strict communication policy, which is also pretty neat. So when, when a child process um, is being created by, a, by, by its parent process, it doesn't know anything about the world. It doesn't even have a, what, what would be get kit on, on Linux. It doesn't know who it is. It just exists and has one thing that is called capability, which is a right to use some remote procedure call to his parent. And it can ask his parent, okay, please give me a, some other kind of services. I need a network service. Um, please pass me on the capability that allows me to use a network service. And the parent can then decide what to do. It could, for example, deny the request and say, no, you don't get anything. It could implement it itself, or it could pass it on to his own parent. Maybe that parent has some notion of a network service. And as a fourth option, it could um, pass this request from this uh, component to some sibling, which may happen to be a network driver or, or a TCP IP stack or something like that. So we have very, we can implement very strict policies based on these low level principles. Um, and I think that that has become clear already. Everything is a user process. Only the kernel down here is, is privileged and everything else is a process. Even things that you might expect to be in the kernel, um, like file systems, drivers, and network stacks, that all lives as an application um, in this tree. So what do we gain by, by having a system of that structure? Um, I already mentioned uh, that um, you can only use a service that was granted by your parents. And now we have the, the neat property um, that we can view the trusted um, computing base in terms of this, this tree and the communication policies. So um, if, we, if we have this orange um, component here and we want to see what's the trusted computing base, we just need to move up the tree because the parent always has control, so we need to trust it not to do the wrong thing. It could just change our address space or, or kill us or something. And also we need to see the, the processes that we rely on. So that parent, that, that grand grandparent could have um, given us a session to, to, that, to that sibling here. And that could, for example, be a file system. Say that's a file system server and Lightbox uses it to store, say, a cryptographic key, then it needs to trust this component to do the right thing, obviously. Can we can we do the questions after the talk? Okay. okay, so keep it for after the talk. Um, so it's interchangeable. So just to, uh, to quickly answer that question. So if you, if you want to know who do we need to trust, we only have to, to look at this up the tree and what's, what remote procedure calls or sessions we are using. If, for example, someone decided to, decides to add something here, like a file system, no problem. We don't care because we do not even have a right to communicate with that and everything is isolated here. Um, if you add a file system to the Linux kernel, that becomes part of your trusted computing base, no matter what you, whether you access any files or, or not. It, does, it doesn't matter. It, will instantaneously in increase your trusted computing base. Does that now mean that we have to re-implement everything in terms of this recursive system and build everything from scratch? Um, the answer obviously is no. There are a, a couple of strategies that we can use to reuse existing software. And I will um, present you three strategies that we are using to do that, actually. The first thing is uh, policy objects. So imagine again, this is not, not, um, not depicted in terms of the tree now, but it's still part of, of such a tree, but I only show the communication policy here. So we have something, something complex like a web browser, um, and we have another other complex thing like a network stack. Typically they work together so the, net, the web browser can access the network. Um, and Consequently, that network stack could attack the web browser and um, exploit some weakness in the web browser. Um, and what we can do, for example, is add some policy object in between. That would be 
uh, something that sits um, in between of uh, in between the communication. And the the nice thing now of this that we can validate what is sent from the web browser to the network stack. Um, we have built something like that for TLS, for example. Um, and the only thing that it does is check whether that communication adheres to some model, like is the TLS connection using the right parameters? Is it using key length that we're expecting? Or is it doing something unsafe, like um, using the null crypto algorithm or something like that? Um, and actually, even if there is a bug here in the, uh, in the web browser, for example, it doesn't do some length check of a protocol message or the library that it's using doesn't do that, um, we could still fix that in that, in that protocol validator in the middle. We could just um, set the fields such that the length is always as the, the web browser expects, the, expect, expects it. That means um, we can use one complex software and the other complex software in a, in a secure manner just by adding such a, such a policy object in between. Another thing is what we call trusted wrappers. Um, so you don't always um, have the opportunity to, to have fo a formal model or at least a good non-formal model of, of the communication protocol. And if that is the case, if that is the case you could, could still shield um, the, the application you want to protect, again, the web browser, from some uh, application that you do not trust, like the network stack. So the network stack is, again, complex and connected to the outside world, so reachable by an attacker. Um, and what you could do is, again, put a component in between the communication of the web browser and the network stack, um, but enforce encryption. So everything that the, net, the web browser is sending out is going to encrypt it, and everything that the network stack is sending in is going to be integrity checked by cryptographic means, and you throw away the messages that do not um, come from an authorized party at the other side. So you can, can, create, an, can create an enclave um, where um, you have, again, such a component on the other side, like a VPN, and you have, when, when you have running trusted software on the other side, then an attacker from this untrusted domain um, cannot detect the web browser. Again, we have achieved better security um, with you using insecure software like network stack as well as the web browser. And the third, um, the third strategy is a bit um, more elaborate, I would say. So we call it transient components. Sometimes you cannot hope for secure software for, for certain complex tasks. And I'm, I'm back to the stage fright issue um, I mentioned earlier. So we, we really, I don't think we can hope for secure media decoders because the formats are so diverse and there are new formats every day. Um, that, and, and it needs to be efficient and often is implemented in unsafe languages for that reason and so we may not hope for, for a secure implementation. And there the third strategy of uh, transient components could be used. How does it work? So we have a trusted component here in green um, that is called the controller. And what it does if you get some, um, some document, some, say, say an audio stream or an audio file from the outside which could compromise our decoder, or is, let's assume it does, um, it instantiates temporarily such a decoding component, which is, which is flawed, which is buggy and can be attacked. Um, and then exposes a simple interface to the application we want to protect, in this case, the audio player. That audio player also is not really secure and can, can, be, can be hacked from the outside. Um, but as this interface, that would then be something simple like a PCM stream, where we are sure that the audio player can protect from, or we, we don't see a way how this could be exploited. Or for a video decoder, if you, if you will, um, this would be a frame buffer where I'm not aware of any, any attack that really could uh, make this audio player be attackable. Um, and as we enforce such a simple interface between decoder and, and audio player, um, it's no issue towards the audio player side. As we make this read only, there is no issue towards the network side even. And um, as an additional benefit, once the playback is done, um, we wipe out the decoding component completely. And for the next file or stream or audio, uh, audio file, we instantiate a new decoder. And um, this way we can reuse buggy software and also protect other potentially buggy software from being hacked by, by um, flaws that we have in here. 
Okay, um, maybe you, you have seen these green components which, which typically did something critical like controlling the instantiation of, of such a transient components, decryption, encryption and stuff and apparently they are critical and the question is what happens if they fail? If we implement them in, the un in an unsafe language um, then we are back to start again and, and have an issue with, with the security of the system. Um, let me start with a, with a, with a short um, quiz, a short question to you. Um, we want to build something very simple. Um, in an unsafe language, that's a C fragment. Um, and we want to calculate the absolute value of some, I think that's a 32-bit integer X. Um, and that's pretty straightforward, right? Well, how you would do this. If X is greater than zero, return X, otherwise minus X. Should be straightforward. Does anybody um, see an issue with that code? You're not the experts here, so I, I, I assume you're maybe not at that level typically? Yeah? Well, if you negate the max int, you get it on the blow. Right? The other way around, but it was definitely the right direction. So if you run it, that's okay, that's as we expected. Um, some small negative number gets positive. Okay, that's also as we expected. Well, yeah. But that, um, that's not as we would expect, right? If you, the most negative number um, ooh, becomes the, the most negative number again, that's clearly a bug. And that's not the, that this function doesn't realize the absolute um, value of, of the input in all cases. So the, the reason is the two complements representation of integers, which is typically used. That means that the most negative value is one smaller um, than the most positive value. And if we, if we negate the most negative value, then we get back to the, get an overflow, uh, uh, underflow, um, and get back to the most negative value. So you were on the right track. Unfortunately, you would have done it wrong also. <laughs> so how can we solve that? How do we solve that in our, in our system? Um, we use a language that's called Spark. Here are the details on the, on the website. Again, it's open source. You can have um, a look uh, and, and, and download the tools immediately if you want. Um, it's actually a language as well as a verification tool set. Um, it's imperative and, and object oriented and it has been designed from start uh, as, as a tool to avoid errors. Not only by doing verification as I will talk about in a minute, um, but also by uh, avoiding unsafe constructs um, in the language itself and in, in the syntax of the language like um, you cannot have the you cannot have that that um, the, the, the comparison and the assignment look different and, and such kind of things and it's it's much easier to, to get the the code right from the syntax perspective it has a strong type system again as, as I mentioned for Inga earlier and that's the neat thing. It does have formal construct, and I will um, present an example um, in a minute. Then, what's also pretty pretty nice is that the verification is flexible. That means you can choose how much effort you put into into the verification. Uh, at the lowest level, just do data and control flow analysis to catch, for example, variables you have used but have not have not um, initialized, or other things like. You um, assign to a variable, um, then assign to it again without using it in between. That can be a sign of, of, of something that you have forgot in between, and that will be flagged by the tools. It can even be more advanced by stating dependency constructs for the data flow, like if I have an encryption function that takes a plain text and a key and outputs a, a cipher text, um, you will really want to have the output depend on the plain text as well as the key. If the output of the, the encrypted output does not depend on the key, something is really fishy with your encryption. And that you can um, annotate and then uh, automatically check by the tools. And the next level would be absence of runtime errors. And that is a proof by the tools that um, you never would get an exception in the, in the code, for example, by um, using an integer out of range or in, uh, having an array access out of bounds and such kind of things. And you would prove before compiling the uh, code the first time, before running it, um, that no runtime errors can happen. And last, functional correctness would then like, um, for the example, if the absolute value 
um, you would prove that it actually returns the absolute value uh, in mathematical terms. What are the benefits and how does it fit our requirements as stated earlier? It's compiled using GCC. Actually, and I didn't mention this so far, it's a, it's a subset of ADA. It's you, uh, compiled with the GCC ADA front end, which is typically available um, on, in, your, in your Linux distribution, for example. Um, it has some runtime free mode. That means you can get rid of any, any support code and only um, have in the binary the code that you have written yourself which is actually nice for building something like drivers and, and operating systems. Um, and you can go away from a restricted subset and also use unsafe code, uh, for example, in C, or you can use the, the ADA superset if you have to. You could bind other um, third-party software uh, and use it in your, in your verified um, implementation, but with the drawbacks, of course. Um, it's used in, in various projects. One thing um, is the Moin separation kernel. That is um, also a micro kernel. It's a bit more static than what we are using. Um, that is implemented in Spark completely, and that shows that it can be used for the lowest level uh, implementation, but also in other areas like satellite software, air traffic control, or the safety things, and also in, in, secure, in a secure workstation um, has it been used. Now let's see how would we would solve that absolute integer issue that we just had on the table. That is Spark. Um, we again have that absolute uh, value function. It gets an integer, returns an integer, everything as before. And as a post condition, we annotated that the result of that absolute value function, uh, well, is the mathematical absolute of x. The implementation looks the same as we just had. And then we run the, the, the tools on it, and it actually comes back with an arrow in this line, and it says, um, the overflow check may fail and even gets us a counterexample. If that lowest value is inserted um, as x, um, then it's going to overflow. We have also means to fix that in the language um, by adding a precondition. So if we do not allow that lowest value, which here is, so Spark has the notion of uh, as these attributes, and um, some type tick uh, first and last would give us the range. And if we say we do not allow the first value, then we have, we have to prove that we don't use it, but we can completely avoid the issue with, with that function. Here's another small example. Um, we have a, a swap function, um, and there is some, typically you would use a temporary variable to, to swap some, um, some two values. But you can also do this um, for, for modular types by, uh, by using three times XOR, then you do not need a temporary variable. And say we want to implement that, we want, to uh, want that, the, that x equals the old value of, of y after running the function and y equals the old value of x. That would be the formal specification of what that thing should do. But we forget the third x or um, that's not directly apparent that this is a swap operation, right? And if we run the tools, it says, okay, it cannot prove that x equals y, the, the old uh, value of y, and if we would uncomment um, this third swap, then it would prove. Okay, how have we used um, that um, system as well as the language? Here's one example um, for an architecture where we uh, employed that uh, trusted filter uh, concept. Um, that system here is a, is a PC, a laptop, that is running um, the Gnode OS that I have presented, it has the hierarchical structure, um, and it has some virtualization on top of it, which is running a, a version of Android. And Android um, not only is vulnerable in the area of media codecs, we also have an issue um, with the baseband. So the, a, a typical telephone typically has two processors, the one, the application processor that's running your app, and the other that's communicating with the radio network and actually is, enables you to make calls with that thing. Um, and they are separated um, uh, so that the, the software in, on the baseband um, can, can get certified, or need, it often needs to get certified. The problem is that software is not really secure, and an attacker from the, from the radio network who fakes a base station, for example, um, could attack your baseband processor and then work to the application processor because they are not very well separated often. Um, and what we try to achieve here is 
um, to actually do that separation. So we have that virtualized Android and we have the second device which only um, has that baseband processor enabled, they are connected through USB. Um, and in the Gnode system, um, we have a filter in the stream between that virtualized Android um, and the baseband. And that filter actually analyzes every single message that's uh, in the communication between Android um, and the baseband and validates that, for example, um, the length of the messages um, actually is, uh, is correct, that the, the, the length fields uh, are in line with the, with the length of the message. Um, we, we plan to do more there. Uh, actually, we want to validate that the protocol of, of the communication between application and baseband processor is, is correct. Um, but for this, we would need a model of that protocol. I will come to that in a second. And that's how it looks like, actually. So um, that's, well, the baseband device happens to be an Android phone where we um, ripped out everything that's Android and just have a baseband with that proxy uh, process that are connected by USB. And that is the, uh, the Gnode system. And this is actually the, the, um, the virtualized Android. And you can use it as normal. It has a, has a touch screen and you can ses send messages. And then here see the log of the filtering component, which says, well, that was an OK message, or I, uh, I dropped this message. And you can send text messages from, from the outside and, and uh, from the virtualized Android. Good. Um, that's what we're using today. Um, but we're not done yet. We, as, as I just mentioned, we want to ha um, have proofs of a protocol, for example. That would be um, th this thing. We want to actually say, is the communication between two endpoints, for example, um, actually adhering to some formal specification? The problem is also for that filter I just presented, we see us implementing communication protocols by hand uh, every day, actually. And that is it's annoying and a lot of work. But also, we do not get a very strong statement about whether this protocol does the right thing. And what we are currently started looking into, and I'm really look. Uh, really would appreciate feedback on that if anybody has, has a good calculus or concept for that. I would like to have some close specification of a communication protocol, but from this specification also derive the, the actual implementation in our target language. Um, plus, hopefully something where we can prove properties about the liveness, but also general correctness of the protocol, like if we get a reply, is it actually a reply to some request we have sent before and, and such kind of thing? That would be really desirable. Something that we also want to um, start doing again is, inter is, is um, adding a theory prover into our tool chain. We have done this quite a, quite a time back with the Isabel um, theory prover, and we've been using Isabel Hall together with Spark that already does work. Um, what you can do and now is the point where I mentioned functional programming. You can do a specification as a functional program in Isabel and then um, prove correspondence to some implementation that you have in Spark. Um, that would be nice. Uh, we just don't do it right now. That would be really good to um, have some stronger statement about our Spark programs in the future. Thank you very much. Questions, yeah. Um, what do you do about compiler bugs in uh, GCC optimization? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a common question, as you, as you would expect. Um, right now, the compiler is part of our trusted, well, call it trusted tool chain. Um, yeah, it, that's, I mean, you have a lot of assumptions, including that the, um, for example, the separation is done right on, on, your, on your platform. As we just saw with Spectre and Meltdown, this assumption is not always correct. Um, so, um, yeah, it's part of the it's part of the trusted trusted tool chain. Yes. Uh, with the construction of uh, the systems in the, especially in the beginning of the OS, would it reduce the use search of like Meltdown and Spectre bugs? Would it be, be more successful? I mean, like in terms of. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that there were some preliminary analysis on the impact of spectrum and melatonin to the, I mean, actually what you're asking is, does it influence the separation of a microtonin? Um, there were some analysis um, and it does have, it does have an influence, um, but um, I don't have the details right now. So it, they, many of the microkernel implementations had to um, revert back to a model where the kernel address space is not mapped into the user address space. And that, as you can imagine, does have a, a significant performance hit, even more on a, on a microkernel. So Mirage OS um, is, is a library OS that typically runs on something that, that gives you separation, right? So like on Xen or KVM, it also happens to run on Win. Um, so um, I don't think that's comparable with the, with the microkernel concept. But I'm not an expert, to be honest. Yeah? Okay, yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Um, I had a discussion with, uh, with the lead engineer of, of, of Adaco, of the Spark product, a while back, and he was mentioning that they do not do their tools in Spark, for example. Um, and the reason is that it comes with a cost, of course. So, um, proving the absence of runtime errors, um, maybe even having a formal model is significant more elaborate and you will not be able to write your word processor or web browser in, in such a kind of language. That's, and that's why we try to minimize the size of these trusted components as much as possible. I will not put anything in a trusted component that we, want to, that we will prove that does not belong there. And so the limits are really that you need to get your, the code that you're implementing small enough to be feasible for the approach. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at using dependency pipelines like Igris for specifying the protocol? Because I know you can do that. I know it as a, I know it exists. We have not looked into that um, right now. I, I came across it, and, and that's definitely something that we're going to look into it. Uh, into, yeah. Great, so thank you.